you very much. So, good afternoon, members. Uh, we are at the Licensing Committee uh, Council Chamber at South Camps Hall on Wednesday, the 23rd of February, 2 o'clock. Thank you for joining us. Uh, so, the first item of this committee is apologies for absence. Um, so, Aaron, can you advise us who has given their apologies? Uh, thank you, Chair. We've received apologies for absence from councillors Deborah Roberts, Alex Mallion, and Claire Delderfield. Thank you very much. And we've just uh, been joined by Councillor Cohn, Councillor Hunt, and oh, Cohn Co and Hunt. Thank you very much. Lovely. Welcome, everyone. Thank you. So, can we start off with um, declarations of interest? Does anybody have a declaration of interest on matters on the agenda? Nope. Okay, thank you. So, minutes of the previous meeting starting at page one and continuing to page seven. Um, do you want me to go through page by page, members, or did you have anything to raise? Okay. Um, I can't see anybody requesting any points. So, this records the minutes. This is the minutes of our meeting on Monday, the 29th of November when we finalised uh, the matters relating to the uh, private hire and hackney carriage licensing. So thank you very much. If everybody's happy with that and has no amendments, then I'll take that as approved. Is that okay by affirmation? Agreed. Lovely. Uh, I can see Councillor Hunt. Yeah, thank you, Chair. I, I just wondered whether it ought to record the fact there were subsequent discussions on the topic. Um... I, no, this is a record of the meeting, so I think we just stick with that. Thank you very much. It might be noted in the minutes of this meeting that that observation was made. Thank you, Councillor Hunt. That's fine. Right. So moving on to item four, we're looking at the street trading policy. Uh, this, you will be aware, members, that this has gone round for consultation, but I will be asking um, Rachel Jackson, our head, uh, senior planning, senior licensing officer, to present the, the, pa the paper. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. As, as you've just mentioned, Councillor, there have been a quite considerable review and scrutiny of this draft policy over the last few months. So members are now asked to adopt the draft as a final policy. The policy has actually been welcomed in its format by the Trade and the National Caterers Association and as a whole has been very welcomed. Uh, once approved, the policy will be kept under review and it will be brought back to this committee for revision as required and in any case within three years. In addition, the fee structure as per schedule of Annex 3 uh, Annex C, I do beg your pardon, will be kept under review and will be revised annually. Uh, quite a short introduction. If there are no questions, Chair, that does conclude my introduction. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms Jackson. Um, Councillor Milnes, you're with us as well as lead member for uh, license, uh, environmental health and licensing. Could, did you, is there anything you would like to say? Well, other than to um, thank Rachel for her work on this um, since uh, joining the, the council and uh, to the lic licensing committee members that have given this um, an, a fair amount of scrutiny. Um, I think the important thing for us to note is that the, this does represent quite a, a change. So to do the universality of licensing across the district. Um, and that uh, we're absolutely committed to make sure that we uh, monitor this and if there are any anomalies that have arisen uh, by this that we haven't anticipated, then we can bring that back to committee for adjustment accordingly. Otherwise, I commend it to the committee. Thank you very much, Councillor Milnes. So, uh, I'll kick off with a question um, which was to do with the fact that because now everybody needs to seek permission, as it were, there are places such as village halls, uh, and this came up because one of the villages in my own area has 
a regular food truck, different food trucks visiting each week. And so I just wanted to clarify what would be the um, financial uh, impact for a village hall committee um, who might have a different food truck every week, you know, uh, coming along. So perhaps, Rachel, could you just explain how that would work? Of course. Thank you, Chair. So what our new scheme will allow is a provision to make it more fast track and a much more streamlined process. So any uh, individual with an interest in the premises, uh, we typically say public houses, which is a car park, but of course, village halls, as you say, which are quite a lifeline to the local community, they will be required to apply for a consented premises, which is a, a very quick form to apply for. Uh, there's two fee structures for this. There'll be one, a standard process for consent, which will be £204 for initial application for a public house, for example, to be able to use the car park for, as you say, the vendors who may come in once a week, twice a month, etc., etc. So that gives them the flexibility for anyone who holds a consented premises trade license to come and trade there. Village halls, we again recognise the financial implications for that. So we have proposed a reduced value of £74 for a charitable or not-for-profit premises. So a village hall, for example, would apply for one-off license and then they will be at liberty to entertain or allow to be hosted uh, a variety of traders who have the consent from the council. Thank you, Ms Jackson. And a Thank you. question from Councillor Howell. Thank you, Chairman. Um, Chairman, I, I just want to ask Ms Jackson a question. Uh, many of these straight traders who have um, been on private land, village hall land, whatever, but not on the actual highways, how are we going to know where they are and what they are? I mean, do we, do we now are going to put out um, a call to everybody or are we already aware of who these people are? How, how do we get to know about them? That's my concern. Think, thank you, Chairman. Uh, thank you, Councillor Howell. I think my, they have to apply for a licence in order to trade in terms of health and safety. So they have to have a licence themselves anyway. So let's ask Councillor uh, uh, Rachel Jackson if you can reply. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Councillor. Yeah, of, co of course, what we have actually this afternoon after the uh, conclusion of this meeting, we have drafted a press release already. We have used the, the business newsletter as well. We will also be emailing all the, the public houses in the district we have got to notify them. Our key point, though, Councillor Howells, is actually using our contacts with the traders already, the Traders Association, say, Food Park and Food Revolution. And they've identified about 25, 30 potential premises, including pubs and village halls already. So they're kind of already in liaison with them because of the kind of uh, the discussions I've been having with them over the last few months. So the trade are already actually aware, not for ourselves, but through our word of mouth from our kind of our colleagues and our, of course, the food park, et cetera, business uh, representatives. So, so tonight we'll have a press release. Tomorrow and for the next few days, we'll be emailing the trade as well to, uh, to advise them of what's happening and obviously inviting them to apply. Um, my idea will be the first tranche of applications will be exactly from the consented premises. Then exactly, everybody will then know who they can go and trade with. So that's the first port of call to approach and publicise with the trade uh, in person. Thank you, Mr. Jackson. I think the question was actually about the traders themselves, perhaps. But Councillor Howell, you wanted to come back? No, no, that's fine. Thank you very much indeed for your very comprehensive reply. Excellent. Um, I just wanted to say that um, I would um, also suggest that you put this information out to the parish councils, because if parish councils don't know, then it's not worth knowing. Thank you very much. Um, and I wanted to ch check that... Thank you. Uh, ..that... For people who, for traders who trade in laybys, I can think of one in my own um, yes. ward, we would have contact with those traders through their license to trade as a food vendor, wouldn't we? Absolutely, Chair, that's correct. So they, they're already kind of covered, they're already aware. And just to reaffirm to Councillor Howell as well that we have been closely liaising with all the parishes as well who have been supportive of this. So once the decision is made today, they'll be reminded, shall we say, of obviously when the, the policy takes place, etc. So everybody locally will be fully aware of the new regime. Thank you. Councillor Bhattacharya. It's Councillor Dr Bhattacharya. Left side. You need to hold it there for a while. 
Councillor Butter. Sorry, you're not registered. You need to hold it there and wait until it shows your name. Sorry, Rachel, uh, Councillor Bhattacharya is just having a struggle with her microphone, so we'll, once we've got that sorted out. From Councillor Harkoyle. Thank you. Is it all right? So um, uh, I do have a question on, on behalf of the community. Do we also have the full... Uh, Full clarity on the on the community events, fundraising, coffee morning, town council, fate and fair, because a little bit of trade also happens, but they are not the commercial traders. So, do we have a full clarity and the policies on for, this for, for community people. events, community fair? I mean, a, a kind of transaction of money or trade. It is not commercial trade, of course, but. There is a transaction of money happens, so do we have a full policy on it? So did you catch that? Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Yes, thank you, Councillor, and thank you, Chair. Yes, if, Councillor, if you wish to refer to page 16 of the agenda, we have within there out of scope, which I hope will address any concerns you have there. So it does actually give a caveat at the bottom of the bullet points. If you look at B, out of scope, on page 16, we look at the bottom point of that, it says trading for charitable purposes, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. And there's a little asterisk below there. So I think that will cover exactly what you're looking at. So protection of the local community and charitable events will in effect be out of scope of the licensing regime. And and also bullet four refers to trading at a fair, fate, or similar one day community event. So that sort of covers some other things, doesn't it? That's um, correct. So thank it's all you. in and there. Councillor. Wilson, you have a question. Yeah. Yes, thank you. I have a question. Um, if, if, for example, a, a pub is a consented premises and wants to provide a food truck for its customers but doesn't have room on the car park, would it be acceptable for that food truck to be on the, the highway, on the street? Yes, indeed, Councillor. They, but they would have to apply for a separate, that would be a standard consent. So the ones you may see currently pitched up on, on the high street, the same would apply for them as well. So there'll still be the two. There'll be standard consent. So number one, the high street, you've got the uh, food van there. That's one. And then the consented premises will be for where trading takes place exclusively in privately owned car parks, for example. So yes, it's quite a liberty to apply for, for both schemes of consent. Thank you. So, so just to come back on that, if a pub does not have its own car park, say, yes. and the the uh, the food operation can only happen on the road, they wouldn't have to apply for standard consent, would they? Because they haven't got anywhere to have it. They they, they would, would only have to do it. Sorry, carry on. Oh, oh, sorry, chair. No, they would actually have to apply for standard consent because they are trading on the highway. Sorry, say again. So because they are trading on the highway, if they're trading at number one, the high street outside the, the old King's Head, then they would have to apply for a standard consent to trade so would, on the that highway. That would come under standard consent. That's correct, yes, Chair. Okay, thank you. Uh, and Councillor Roberts online. Do go ahead, Councillor Roberts. Thank you very much, Chairman. Sorry, Chairman, I, I was a little late getting in. My machine just didn't want to learn today. It, it crashed at the very end of council yesterday, and then it didn't want to start this morning, uh, this lunchtime. So I hope that you've put my apologies. I'm, I'm still a bit, a bit battered and bruised, Sorry. so um, doing it this way. Um, yeah, I, I, I um, like the report. I think it's very clear. Um, can I just have some a uh, little bit of clarification um, about the revocations of the consent? Um, is the is it going to be? Obviously, it seems that we, they can um, approach us and ask for that to be reconsidered. Is it going to be set up the same way as we do with ordinary licensing, three members? And is there any uh, follow up that they can can they go to the um, uh, to the uh, Magistrates Court, or is it? Are we the final deciders? Thank you, Thank Chairman. You. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Roberts. Yes, just to confirm, the, the terms of delegation for your committee will be amended slightly so to include 
or to confirm again the street trading provision. So absolutely same as the licensing panel, appeals panel, three members, and your decision is final. There is no grounds to appeal further. So they, so they can't appeal to the magistrate's court? That's correct. That's it. Your decision is final. So if we have a three-member panel, uh, Ms Jackson, can we also invite into that panel um, the people who made representations? And yes. That sort of we, thing, as we that, look that, for a premises licence Absolutely. I don't, yes, that will be the next kind of the process to confirm with our committee services. But as I say, this is absolutely the intention. That will be saying very, very similar format to a, a licensing hearing subcommittee or indeed a, a tax appeal. That's very clear. Thank you, Chairman. So there'll be, a, there'll be a right to a fair hearing. Thank you, Councillor Roberts. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. That's lovely. Thank you. OK, and that um, I'm mindful we have some other questions. Um, and I'll come to mine afterwards. So, Councillor Hunt. Oh, sorry, I didn't have you. If you would like to take Councillor Harvey, I'm quite happy to take Councillor Harvey's well, question first. Um, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Hunt. Um, I just wondered if... Um, Ms. Jackson could clarify, I'm not sure whether this would be within the purview of this policy, but um, the policy before us does touch on um, public nuisance, particularly noise nuisance. Um, so first question is, um, if in the case that, and I think it's quite common for these um, mobile food um, stores, for example, to have a generator, um, and in, in that case, um, should we not be, as, as for music reproduction, I think, um, specifying some kind of decibel level and distance from um, if there is a generator running? Um, and, and secondly, um, I note that um, non-vehicle um, com uh, internal combustion engines aren't, aren't covered by the same uh, pollution and emission regulations as road vehicles, but there is a piece of EU legislation, which I think is now adopted into UK law, um, called the uh, Non-Road Mobile Machinery Regulation. So they were effective from 2017 and cover sort of legal limits on emissions from um, static generators, um, etc. Et um, because I'm aware that some of these, um, you know, mobile uh, generators can, can be very poorly maintained and that in a sort of um, urban setting would be uh, quite dangerous to health, I would have thought. Ms. Jackson. Okay, thank you, Chair. Um, that, in a way, has been taken into account, but I think as um, we have from Brian Milnes, he mentioned, first of all, this is kind of a work in progress, very much of a living policy. But I will say, Councillor, that obviously since the, I think it's 2010, when this policy first came into place, we're not really, apart from obviously proliferation of street trader venues we saw as a result of the pandemic, I'm not expecting a surge in the amount of traders in our district. So I'm expecting it to be, be the same, but obviously everybody to be subject to the licensing regime, if that makes sense. So I'm not, um, speaking to my colleagues in environmental health, I have not been made aware, or they're not aware, of any noise complaints resulting from the noise of generators or the emissions, but I say, obviously, if that is something we need to address in the future, I'm obviously more than happy to do so. Uh, but I say, I'm not expecting it to be uh, as a result of public nuisance, because I say, communications with my colleagues in environmental health have not you know, produced any intelligence to say we've had any such nuisance thus far. And of course, looking at the hours of operation as well, slightly different to say pub nuisance, which could go on to say 11, 12 o'clock at night, a lot of these traders, these mobile units, uh, Food Park and Food Revolution, are tended to finish about 9, 9.30. It's a lot more family-friendly hours, shall we say, than the typical, what you'd expect to be unreasonable hours of disturbance. Thank yeah, you. Yes, thank you. Um, and I realise it's a bit um, late in the day um, to introduce this, but I wonder if we could give that some consideration when this policy comes up for uh, review at the next uh, juncture. Yeah. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. And um, I'll come back on my question, which relates to that later. Um, Councillor Hunt. Thank you, Chair. Um, two things. So one thing, uh, the on the subject of the food standards hygiene rating, it mentions that as a evidence of that required application. Um, I hope that's also required in the streamlined renewal process. Um, 
because tree, you know, it ought to be, and it ought to be grounds for revocation, presumably by some by some means, if, if it should change during the uh, course of the year, or however long it goes for. Um, but the other thing I wanted to do, I wanted to come back to this question about the pub that hasn't got a car park, because it seems to me that that, from, that is a, a great disadvantage now compared with the one that does, because a pub that has a car park can get consented premises and then can attract, at ad hoc, uh, any number of food vans, which themselves merely need to have the, um, the consented trader, is it? The, 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 the visiting trader kind of thing. Um, That's great, yes. Yeah, yes. Uh, and that makes that arrangement very easy, and quite a lot of pubs do do that. Now, one that doesn't have its own van to put that on cannot do that, and each of those vans that visits, if I understand rightly, will have to apply to trade at that spot, which means that ad hoc, it's going to be burgers this week or this day, and, and, and hot dogs tomorrow won't work, right? Um, and I can see that's probably nothing we can do about now, but um, is it possible, maybe in a future version of these, uh, of these um, conditions, to, to somehow enable a business in that situation to apply for consented non-premises, you know, consented use of a piece of road, so that they could enjoy that that stand that style of um, of visiting traders. Over to you. Um, thank you, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Councillor. The, the issue with that, though, Councillor, is it is on the highway, so it would be subject to the same regime as a standard consent. So the operator of the pub business or restaurant for example, the pub business would not have the authority to control and access and manage who uses that part of the highway that is the real uh, distinct problem we have got if that makes sense oh, oh you say there might be a, a disadvantage in a way um however it would just be up to the trader then if the trader's already trading there um obviously with our reduced fees and more attractive uh, streamlined process we would hope they would still be encouraged to trade there outside the King's Head on the Tuesday evening and then obviously move elsewhere within the district. But unfortunately, I don't see any route for um, allowing almost like a disabled parking bay outside a house, for example. I can, that's what I'm trying to visualise, almost like a, a reserved or parking spot for a, a, a food trader here. I don't envisage that being a possibility, but of course, I'm more than happy to explore that for, for future consideration. Okay, thank you. I understand that it's not easy. Um, could you also comment on my question about the food standard renewal? Well, absolutely. We work, obviously, uh, we're based within the environmental health team as well. So any kind of breaches of food, food hygiene regulations will obviously be dealt with by my colleagues in environmental health, which would naturally result in a, if need be, a revocation of the street trading consent. So the two very much go hand in hand. Thank you. Can I just come back on the point um, that Councillor Hunt made about, again, about premises without a car park? Because I can think of some situations where through custom and practice, a trader has parked up on the highway. This actually is a verge in my village. It's technically highway, but the parish has always approved them being there, and highways have accepted that over time. Um, so what would they have to do? Yep, they would apply, because it's highway, which includes a, the grass verge, in the new regime, would certainly be subject to the standard consent. So they would have to apply for their uh, street trading consent, Chair. Mm. Right, thank you. Councillor Mills, you, oh, sorry. Um, Councillor Mills, did you want to come in at that point? Or I've got yes, other questions you, coming. Thank you, Chair. So um, one of the uh, things that we've um, been aware of are, are uh, for example, the people that have organised um, North Stowe's uh, food trucks have made uh, gone to great extents to um, uh, encourage their uh, traders uh, to use uh, reusable uh, plastics or um, uh, recyclable uh, containers. Um, so they've got uh, green bins um, <laughs> able to be used. And I think something similar has uh, happened at Camborne. So whether we need to codify this, uh, for example, or other aspects of the way that they operate, uh, as uh, uh, Jeff uh, was saying, 
uh, is a question that we can come back to um, over over time as this uh, uh, new policy develops and to see whether there's any useful such additions. And I think again, um, uh, Steve Hunt's um, uh, suggestions that there could be a possibility. I'm not quite sure in the same way that uh, Rachel uh, describes how, how we can do that. I mean, the, the once you're onto the public highway, you're onto the public highway. Um, uh, yes, it may be a disadvantage if a pub hasn't got a car park, but that's the, the nature of the beast. Uh, so I think that might be more more awkward. But certainly, we, I think I think as you've seen uh, with the workshops that we've had with with yourselves as committee members, we're very open to uh, to developing this policy going forward. Thank you, Councillor Mills, and that's actually I'll come in now because that was the point I wanted to make, and that was that it would be a shame if in this policy we lost some of the control that we've had previously. Uh, and I know when I have been advising local parishes, I've said to them, you know, of course, this gives you the opportunity to condition, you know, to say what you want in terms of where will they dispose of litter? Where will they put their generator? Which side of the building would you prefer it to be? Or, you know, um, and what are they going to do about um, provision of water or, you know, anything like that? So I'm just wondering, is all of that embodied in an existing license or is that something that, that would naturally come out of the application that they would make? For, so I think, um, I think I'll um, give you an, an example, particularly of, of pubs, um, uh, who are obviously typically provisioning uh, water and power uh, to uh, these trucks that are operating on, on their premises, as are um, some of the uh, parishes and towns already. Uh, so that's certainly the case in North Stoke. Um, so these, um, you know, supply, supply of um, utilities, for example, uh, are out with our policy. Uh, so they are uh, entirely Thank you, Councillor Mills. That's your misunderstanding of what I was asking, I think. Uh, it's helpful to know. But what I was asking was, will that requirement to agree that with the parishes come out of the consent application? And, and I was asking Rachel that because it's whether it's embodied in the application, if you see what I mean. Right, well, no. so... so so, so for the, oh sorry, sorry, Councillor Mills, sorry, do you want to speak or should I? So I was just going to say, what would happen is, as per the current regime, a the um, parish council would be notified of any such application. So we received an application for a consented premises that would provide details of where the trading is to take place. And then the parish council would have the 21 days in which to come back and make any observations. So that okay, was, so, should so address that's when they any get their opportunity. So that's when they get that their is, opportunity to say. That's correct, yes. Yeah. But is, are the prompts to, for the trader to think about those things like, where am I going to get rid of my litter and all of that, are those, are those in the application? They are not necessarily within the application, but the part of the conditions as well, which obviously they have to sign to say, confirm they will uh, comply with X conditions. So it's very much within there as well. Okay, thank you very much. Sorry, Councillor Mills, you. did you want to finished anything you wanted to say there okay okay That's so fine. councillor cone thank you uh, thanks chair <coughs> um i'll start by saying that i'm very happy with the um draft street trading policy that's been put in front of us <coughs> i think it's very well set out um the the questions i i had i think have already been asked by councillor harvey they were, they were kind of around emissions and idling vehicles um, and uh, provision for, um, you know, uh, or conditions, I suppose, not provision for um, traders, you know, operating in a, a green way, if you like. So, um, but, you know, there, there's obviously bits throughout the report on uh, noise and sort of being, you know, courteous to others and stuff around. And so I think that sort of uh, addresses 
that and as you say that there, there'll be conditions individually put on each sort of application which I think is what you're saying will we'll cover that essentially in terms of you know making sure we haven't got engines running for hours on end and, and stuff like that um, the the other thing I was going to say is on uh, the point of when uh, someone has a ex successful application, will the ward members be notified so we know that there's going to be X trader coming into one of our villages within in the parish? Um, I, I know obviously it has to go through, uh, you know, consultation um, and, and licensing and everything else, but it might not be that those ward members are involved in that process. So will they be informed on on a successful application? Thanks very much. Thank you. Yes, thank you, uh, Chair, and thank you, Councillor Ken. By all means, we can notify either by way of the, I'm not sure what it's called, so the, the member's briefing or the bulletin. We could perhaps put something in there to say uh, licensing updates. Um, that's something I have raised before. Um, hopefully, we could do that. If not, it might be just a, a method of just sending you a courtesy email to confirm this application has been granted. I think an email would be so preferable, can, so we don't have time for it. Thank you, Councillor. Um, yes, Councillor Wilson. Thank you. Um, do the various types of consent in this um, paper, would parish councils be informed of all of those consents for their um, approval or what or comment? Thank you, Councillor Wilson. Yes, I'm just looking actually back at my own notes, and I should have really mentioned this to Councillor Cohn's reply. You said, will you be made aware? You actually will be aware as part of the actual initial application process, the consultation process. So you will receive a copy or details of each application, Councillor, in your ward. Um, and I think, Councillor Wilson, does that answer your, uh, apologies, does that answer your question as well? So, yes, so town and parish councils will be notified of an application as yourself as Ward of Division Council, Council Laws will be notified of any application as well. So would that include um, um, street trading? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, any application we receive, apart from where an individual, if you think about a, 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 an alcohol licence with a personal licence, you won't be notified of that because that's really quite irrelevant, quite frankly. But where an application has been made for a standard consent, so say, a burger van, for example, has been asked to trade on one high street. You receive that application. And where the Rose and Crown has applied for consented premises, you receive notification of that application as well for comment. Thank you. Uh, so, Councillor Hunt, did you want to come back? Yes, thank you, Chair. And I'm on page 21, where it's on grandfather rights, chapter section 11. Um, I just want to clarify about how long those grandfather rights continue, because it says that the trade will have the right to retain their pitches subject to basic safety principles, but then clearly they, they also have to apply with a sort of extra yes. grace period. Um, but does that grandfather right mean that their application will not be rejected for reasons such as commodity duplication or unit unsuitability? What, what would be, it says basic safety principles, is that, is, am I reading that correctly, that it means that some of those criteria we'd normally use will not be applied to them? No, a policy counter. Sorry, sorry, Chair. Sorry, uh, no, that will say that they'll still have to make sure all the safety requirements, of course, are met. And of course, the, the scenario could be that a valid representation is made to an application. Um, however, obviously, there's kind of protection available to support the local businesses. So if a business has been trading in an area that was previously not a consented area for, say, the last two years, then there'd probably be an expectation that their right to trade providing, of course, they can meet all the conditions and all the requirements are met. So that's where the protection is. So a right to be able to continue trading there, but of course, not bypassing any of the, the standards or requirements whatsoever. If that makes sense. Can I come back on that? So, yeah. so if, if there were two, if there were, I mean, we've got this thing called, um, what is it called? Commodity duplication. So suppose it's a situation, I'm not saying it is, but there were two hot dog stalls 20 metres apart, and they both grandfathered, would they both get to continue doing hot dogs, or would we have to say to one of them, there's too many hot dogs here? Exactly. Well, that's, I mean, we're saying this may be taken into account, and that's the critical point here, because we're not saying, for example, we may have one trade on one day, 
And the, the trade were quite interested in this as well. They, they were feeling, and I think more for them, particularly were saying, are you saying that if we have a fish and chip van on a Monday, we can't have one on a Tuesday? Absolutely not. We are not there to, um, if the market is there and people that wish to, you know, select a certain uh, cuisine, then that's absolutely their prerogative. Um, but what we didn't want to see was a saturation, for example, say four, four hot dog vans outside a hot dog shop, for example, is to provide that flexibility and variance. But if we've currently got two traders there who are providing the service to the local community, then there should be no reason why they do not continue, subject to, of course, meeting the requirements. Thank you, Ms. Jackson. And Councillor Hales. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> um, so, Ms. Jackson, if I may. Um, the planning service send councillors a planning update weekly so all of the outstanding applications and the ones that have been approved in my view and that seems to be a very worthwhile format i just wonder whether across the year that could be something perhaps done monthly if i you know it doesn't necessarily be weekly but that might be the format that we you could potentially adopt so that all councillors are just notified of all um, licenses being granted, they don't have to be in their area, they just have to drill down and find it and that's fine. That gives a, a nice easy way. Um, and it was the last point that uh, you made, Steve, with regards to the four burger vans or hot dog vans and outside a hot dog shop. Um, I can't remember the, 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 the name of the policy, but in, if I recall, Cambridge have a, we can't have too many hairdressers in the same road. But South Cam's in planning terms, that is, did not. And it's got a name for that policy. And what are two duplication? I don't know. Right? But <laughs> I'm, I'm assuming then that we do have that in licensing. Comes on to page 19. Page 19. Did you want to explain that, Rachel? Thank, thank you, Kate. If you just say yes, we may take that into account. If, for example, uh, we'll use Northstar as an example of a, of a growing community, should we say, or a new a bu a building town. If, for example, we would not really want to... See, there's two ways we can approach that. In the planning policy for Northstar or new development, we could say restriction on, and again, I can't remember the, the use, the multi-use of a, an area, but you say we wouldn't want to have, possibly, probably, on one small row of street uh, shops, six fish and chip shops, and outside the fish and chip shop, to fish and chip vendors. So this is trying to work with the policy. And this going forward is actually something I will be working with with my colleagues in uh, the, the project planning. I forget the titles, I do apologies for that, but within the planning development as well to make sure we do enhance the availability of services available to our residents as well. So it's very much working with them. So you will see in the coming years, revisions coming to the policy with regard to the commodities perhaps only in, in certain areas, almost um, a bit like a, a licensing gap policy to have saturation or stress policies where the nighttime economy is at such a level to cause a disruption to the local community. So I think, Councillor Hales, there's, a, there's certainly options there to look at, but right now, uh, talking to the trade and the, the trade representatives, there doesn't appear to be a clash or a significant strain or stress, so as to say, this is alarming, we need to stop, but it just gives provision to say, if it comes to it, enough is enough, we have sufficient uh, of these commodities in place. If that Thank answers that part that's, of the question. That's, that's lovely, then, Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. And the, the, the initial part you said about notification of all licences issue, that is something I had raised previously, and I'm more than happy to raise again, because in the previous authority I worked for, notifying uh, the councillors of any applications that had been granted, including temporary event notices, it was very welcomed. And it was something I was trying to recreate here as well. So if I'm able to do so, I shall indeed. Okay, and um, when we t get involved, sometimes it's because there are complaints about particular premises or vendors or whatever. And so I'm looking at 19 revocation of a consent and I note that there are conditions that would cause a revocation and then it says the matter will be referred to the licensing panel who may determine it necessary with regards to promote public safety and or pre prevent nuisance or annoyance to affect parties to look at it again. What I'm concerned about is um, when that happens, usually people wait quite a long time through annoyance and disturbance and 
upset before they even report it as a concern because they wait to see if it's going to be just as bad next week. And so by the time they actually summon up the confidence to contact us, often it's been going on already for quite some time. So I just want to be clear about the terms under which residents can raise their concerns that although the vendor might be in spirit complying with the conditions that they are it's not working so i'm just wondering what um so there's two the two cases where they where they're not complying with conditions but also where they might be but it turns out that that's really still causing quite a lot of disturbance so i'm just wondering how do we handle that and how long does it take for people um, to have to go through that misery before something can be brought to panel. Thank you, Chair. It really would depend on the, the nature of the, the concern, of course, because oftentimes it is a lot more different I, for a, a resident who, for example, moves next door to a pub or a pub changes hands and all of a sudden the pub is very quiet, they're offered in harmony, and then obviously it's not quite so easy for a pub to uproot and move elsewhere, nor is it easy for the resident to move elsewhere. However, with a mobile trader, I think there's a lot more simple approaches that could be taken here. So I would like to think that the, any potential misery endured will be very short lived because by our own enforcement activity as well, because of course this is something we'll be picking up on in the new year and just the general conversations we have, you know, with the traders should allay any concerns. But my, my wish or desire to any residents who are feeling they are under nuisance or concern about an operation of the premise, uh, a trader should contact us right away. And that will, that will all follow suit with our new, when we start publicising the new regime further. So, so if um, a, a neighbour found that the street trader was causing a severe nuisance straight away, you know, the very first time they turned up and they complained then, what would be, would we have to observe for a while or would you contact the trader or how, you know, if it came through to environmental health or to licensing, yeah. What action, you know, obviously you determine on the time, what sort of action would be taken? Yeah, absolutely. It would depend very much on, say, the, the nature of the complaint and the allegation. If it was relating to food safety, then, of course, we'd look at, you know, probably an immediate revocation of that. If there's any risk, immediate risk to public safety and harm, then, of course, immediate action needs to be taken. A bit like a taxi driver, where it's a public safety risk, look at immediate revocation. So a very swift referral to the licensing panel to determine that. If, however, it was just, you know what, you had a radio on, the radio on was too loud, switch off the radio, don't have that, for example, and then that may address the problem. So there's, there's, two, there's two different approaches there, depending on the severity of the issue. But obviously, on receipt of the complaint or an allegation, we would, first of all, make contact with, obviously, once we've got the information from the, the complaint, speak to the, the stall holder or the vendor and assess what the problem is. Are there any steps we can do to mitigate the, the circumstances? If not, obviously... But like a revocation of a premises license, it is a worst case scenario. We want to support the trade and we want to make sure that the trade obviously work in support of the local community. Because we do realise that over the last few years in particular, uh, they have been providing a valuable resource to our local community. So I would hope it's not as as horrific as it possibly, you know, maybe it's sounding today. But, I, you know, it's a very worst case scenario. But obviously residents need to be assured that if anybody isn't compliant or is causing a public nuisance, we, the licensing authority will address that certainly thank you and the last thing i wanted to check about was do the conditions um cover things like storage of gas bottles and things in yes. safe locations yes it's all about the safety at the end of the day yes thank you councillor hales did you want to come back if i may i'm because i've learned the phrase com commodity duplication now which is <laughs> now all about like traders um it's just a under page 19 under the general section rachel yes yeah um i just got a query it sounds to me like some of the sentences are working against each other but that could be my interpretation and it says that within the proposed pitch location there are already traders or, bus or businesses offering the same service or providing uh, same principal food commodity during the hours of the consent is applied for. This is to ensure a diverse offering of services um, subject to grandfather rights. So I'm assuming if you had four sausage vans, all with grandfather rights, 
may carry on. Um, competition issues will not be a consideration. So those kind of, in my head, go against each other, those two sentences. One, you're not, the competition isn't going to be a consideration, but there could be four vans there because they've got grandfather rights. Or you're trying to offer a diverse service of different food products. So that would be my only question on that one there. So it was a danger that I learned two new words. Okay, Sorry. well, we, we, yes, so thank you. So we, there's very much looking for just providing the services that are available for the trade at the end of the day. For me to go and say, uh, we're not having free fish and chip vendors outside on this street in, the, in, in three days. Who am I to say that? If a business is making money from that and they're providing a valuable, tra a valuable trade for themselves and earning a livelihood, then obviously, and that is satisfying the, the local needs, because obviously if people didn't want them, the, the traders wouldn't be there, then that's a kind of suggestion there. So we wouldn't be arguing or mandating that we can't have two or three, but when we get to two or three outside fixed premises, say we've got three fish and chip shops in a row, and outside that we've got a fish and chip van selling just standard fish and chip products, then that may be put into question. However, we're not we're not able to challenge the kind of, um, if someone came back and said, oh, I, I've got fish, this is not unfair competition, that is not something we can entertain. So, thank you. So, can, so my understanding is, it, I think part of the problem with this is it's a very long sentence, if you like, because the if you the thought process starts on page line two of the grounds for representation, refusal, or revocation under item eight on page eighteen. So basically, it says the council. It's like national planning policy framework, it's you know, presumption in favour of planning. It says the council will normally grant a street trading consent unless one or more of the criteria below are identified, and then there's a caveat there, and then it says unless there's um, commodity duplication with the exception of grandfather rights. So it's just that it's almost like that's a whole thought <laughs> goes through the policy, but you sort of lose the bit at the beginning. However, read correctly is helpful. So thank you very much. Are there any other questions? Councillor yes, Councillor Wilson, go ahead. Thank you. Um, I was just wondering, would the presence of a, a school in the vicinity have a bearing on whether an application is allowed? At this stage, Councillor Wilson, no, um, unless there are obviously grounds for concern about unhealthy lifestyles. I think that's what you're probably raised into and the, the junk food etc which is something they alluded to earlier about the project working with um the div uh, planning team with regard to north stone development of that as a i'm not sure what the terminology is a healthy town um so there could be in the future options to look at what other steps we need to put within our policy and other particular zones or areas that we would not wish to see trading take place but again this is all for kind of our policies is going forward this certainly is an option to look at. Okay, thank you. And I'm sure we have considered that in when, in planning terms when change of use has been proposed, um, you know, the suitability of the location for that change of use, but that's for the fixed premises. Okay, members, I think we're pretty much there. I cannot see any further questions. So um, in that case, members, Thank you very much, Ms. Jackson, for all the work that's gone into this and for doing a very thorough consultation um, with the parish councils. That's been really helpful. Um, so I'll turn our, I'll turn our attention to the recommendation on page nine of our agenda, which is that the licensing committee approves the street trading policy to take effect from the 1st of March, uh, 2022. Um, can I ask? seconder <laughs> thank you councillor wilson will second that so members can i take a vote on that please great lovely super thank you very much uh, miss jackson that's really helpful and thank you thank for you. a very comprehensive report so with that um i'll call the licensing committee to a close at 14:49. thank you very much indeed and could you please